Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you appreciate these videos, you can support at patreon.com slash toahado. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash toahado. And if you are not allergic to the written word, you can sign up for the newsletter at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack.com. And Aksum is the subject of our podcast today with our returning guest, Izana Teodros. And last time we got into the kind of pre-Oxumite period. So now it's time for us to tackle the Oxumite period. Before we get into that, Izana, I just want to like make these videos quasi standalone. So can you tell us why would you want to go dig through the annals of history? What makes this stuff interesting to you at all? Because there are a lot of people your age who have no interest in that. They might, uh, you know, rep a flag. And nowadays we don't know if it's red and yellow, if it has a tree on it, if it's green, yellow, red, blank, if it's got a star on it or it's got a line on it. But it's easier for people to wave a flag than to dig through dusty books. What, what makes you interested in the past? Uh, thank you, Hanok, for having me again. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great, excellent question. Um, I think when it comes to history, there's um, a fundamental, one fundamental issue that we have in our history or in our culture that's like illustrated by these uh, so, uh, anthropologists is that history is not respected amongst the Ethiopian people for the most part. Um, and especially when it comes to reading, there's definitely a lack of uh, willingness to do so. So when we have that already, that um, basis for like the Ethiopian people and when it comes to the youth diaspora here or just the youth in general uh the reason why they don't want to read or you know seek into anything about Ethiopian history is in regards to like the lack of pride that they might have about Ethiopia um so for me personally I'm a very powerful person even though I was born and raised in America I love my country very much and that's due to my parenting my family everything like that so when you have that pride about your country um it, you see knowledge about it and this can be multi multifaceted it can be history it can be culture etc cetera, etc cetera. even then loving your country does not mean it's like unnecessarily like a straight line and uh, into following history uh because we see a lot of people that are patriotic about ethiopia but they don't want to learn the history so in terms of that sense i think that comes from my dad he's very um he has like he's read i don't know like four 300 400 books about ethiopia like 200 books about just like all these different, like whether it comes from Greek philosophy, just know all these different things, like knowledge, just knowledge in general. So I think seeing that like really pushed me into like following into his footsteps uh, and in terms of just wanting to learn more and just being knowing as much as possible. Uh, Cause that's how you, you know, gain any footing in this world is, you know, knowledge is power as they always say. And especially about our own people, it's, it's very important, to, especially to understand the, the things that we see today. So, yeah, that's good. Thank you for that. And even once you get to this stage, like you said, which is nonlinear of appreciating the, the history, the context of our people, when you look at history, what is history, right? It's the written record of things from someone's point of view, be they victor or not, usually victor. Uh, when we go as far back as we did last time into the pre oxomite history, it's very difficult. And we prefaced it with, you know, there are a lot of debates and arguments, even about like the meanings of basic words like Ethiopia and Habasha, some of it delving into Hotepari, some of it delving into actual, you know, rigorous history. Then you get to the Aksumite history. Even that period is very blank. I know from a biblical studies point of view, we see things like the book of Job, the book of Daniel, the Garima Gospels, and some random Psalters, which is the book of Psalms. But there's there's not a ton of evidence even in that period. And I know there's a lot of Shroud of Mystery, even in the Zagwe period, which comes next. The period from the Solomonic times in 1270 to the current is, is in general the the easiest to study and especially from the 1800s to now and even more especially the 20th century they're just more source materials i mean the stuff on Haile Selassie is just way more than what we have on on anybody else because of how close it is to our our period what makes you interested in studying a harder to study period a lot of people would 
maybe get lazy about digging into the deep past and more study the the more recent past. So what makes the ancient history something worthy of study versus the stuff that's uh, in the past 100 to 200 years? I think when it comes to that, um, in order to get a full grasp of the history of humanity or just Ethiopia, if we're just focusing on Ethiopia itself, you need from like point A, like from the beginning all the way to, you know, point Z, like where it stands right now. And that really gives you a full picture. I think, you know, like in our last video, you were talking about how people are just looking at the history of Ethiopia in the last 200 years. And that's very, a very skewed perspective of what the nation is and what, you know, people have d dealt with and all these different, different circumstances that have been entailed. Um, and I, even I find it difficult for me to learn about like the, like the Aksumite or, you know, pre-Ethiopian history, or, you know, because, you know, actually more like, it's it's more sign i would say it's less historical more scientific in terms of like archaeological evidence because there's still interpretation left up to it um so it's just this full picture that i want to see in order to understand our people and understand our country uh that really pushes me to learn like from point a to point c beautiful and i, I was on my friend uh Dawit of the north podcast he doesn't really have a name for it yet but he's trying to do a more current events current affairs type show and i recently said you know one of the biases of the west by the way quick aside i like that you said a to z and not a to z i know a lot of people are british influenced uh, in ethiopia but we are proudly americans as well as ethiopians so we will say z but uh, on his program i said a lot of times in the west we have this bias towards the rugged individual and the agency of the individual and we see ourselves just as a person now. So they're they're really partial towards the history that's closest to them. But you and I see ourselves as a product of these generations, centuries, millennia of peoples. And as a product of all that, we have some sort of duty to reflect on what you're saying is the, the fuller picture. So last time we left off the pre oxomite video around the, the Queen of Sheba period, can you bring us from the Queen of Sheba to this place called Aksum? Uh, some people nowadays, I see them writing it Aksum with the hot. <laughs> but uh, bring us to Aksum. All right, <laughs> I will do so. Um, and just uh, also uh, one last point I wanted to make about what you were just iterating is also history is you know, relevant to who we are as an individual, like you were saying. So it makes much more sense um, to focus on something in the current like or near uh, past than something in the you know way past in the i mean in the past and everything so but anyways uh to go into the axum or pre axum everything like that so um we kind of left off we talked about the queen of sheba a little bit uh kingdom of damat um from our previous video uh but i'm just going to i'm going to recover those subjects um in a little bit more detail uh, to give uh, a full scope of this time period. So what, we, uh, what we're talking about is the Queen of Sheba. So as uh, probably a lot of people know, it's like this is, you know, into just completely in Ethiopian history or completely into the minds of Ethiopians is that the Queen of Sheba or Queen of Saba was, um, she was the Queen of Ethiopia. And what happened is she went to Israel to visit King Solomon. And the reason why she did this is because she heard about you know, the great uh, knowledge that he had and the great, you know, success that he had. So she wanted to seek uh, information from him. So she went uh, to Israel and this was around 1000 BC or so. Um, so she went there and long and behold, you know, the story is that she got seduced by King Solomon and King Solomon ended up, um, they ended up uh, having sex and then ended up having a baby. That baby was to become, you know, uh, Menelik. So Men when the Queen of Sheba, you know, went back to Ethiopia after her trip, uh, Menelik became a man after 20 years or so and went back to Israel. So when Israel, I mean, our King Solomon was still in power then, and when Menelik uh, visited him, uh, King Solomon offered him the kingdom of Israel. To which uh, Menelik said no, because he had a deep affinity for Ethiopia as he was born and raised there. He was close to his mother and he went back to Ethiopia, but he stole the Ark of the Covenant or the Tabot from uh, Israel. And this signified a shift uh, in terms of 
you know, God's chosen people, which was illustrated by King Solomon himself, which he said, you know, God has chosen the Ethiopian people and the, as the Holy Land and everything like that. Um, yeah, so that's sort of just a brief recap of the story. I think more than so, like the importance, um, we might cover it more in the detail of Kubra Negus, but as- I was, uh, was going to say, that's the main resource yeah, you're drawing. Yeah, right? yeah, main resource, yeah. So this, this, yeah, this is coming from the Kubra Negus or the Glory of the Kings. So this Glory of the Kings was first originally wrote uh, during the Aksumite period in the around 500 to 600 AD but it wasn't fully transcribed until um, the beginning of the Solomonic dynasty around the 1300s or so. But the importance of this Kibra Negus cannot be um, understated. Uh, I think one of the main reasons that we see in Ethiopia right now, this is drawing parallels to what's going on, is that amongst the elite, we see this, this complete you know, confusion or there's no consensus about the Ethiopian identity. You know, this is like a national question. What, what does it mean to be Ethiopian? Um, but what we had when we had the Kubra Negus or was when it was in place is that the elites had an agreement or they had an idea of what it meant to be Ethiopian or what, you know, what legitimized the, the identity of being Ethiopian. And this, you know, trickled down to the people as well. So what we see now is that there's a lack of, um, there's a lack of legitimacy in what it means to be Ethiopian. And that derives from not having some substantial, you know, form that, you know, just encompasses the Ethiopian people in general. So, yeah. Yeah, I've, uh, this is a quick aside to bring people to modern stuff. There have been a number of these videos shared on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter of seems like foreign exchange students. And they are Ethiopians who made it to America in these black and white kind of new shows. And they're on panels with people of different countries. And they distance themselves from words like black and from Negro. And uh, to be honest, a lot of the things they're saying are uh, offensive. You know, they talk about differences between the people in, in ways that I think are not quite based in the facts of the situation, but the kernel of truth beyond, uh, you know, to what they're saying relates to what you and I covered in the background as kind of two major strains of Ethiopians, the Nilotic speakers, and then the Kushites and Semites who've been mixing for centuries. And there are various types of Kushites and, and Semites who have been mixing. And some people are a little bit more purely Kushitic stock, and some people are a little bit more Semitic stock with the Nilotic mixing the least amount. And I think that's the kind of basis for which these people in, in panels have been uh, speaking. Are, are you talking about right now the kind of identity of the the absolute monarchs who ruled the the you know this place we're calling Ethiopia, or are you talking about in general like all of the inhabitants of Ethiopia? I would say it, it definitely encompasses both. Um, of course, it gave the monarchy a, a sense of legitimacy and everything um, in order to rule Ethiopian people. But you know, like as uh, Johannes illustrated when the um, or Johannes the Fourth, when he, uh, the British took the Kubra Negus from Teodros when they invaded Ethiopia, um, he said, "You know, I need the Kubra Negus in order to rule the people. Like it's my source of legitimacy." Um, so I think definitely because the Kubra Negus, you see, the beauty of it is, of course, it gives legitimacy to the to the, the you know the Solomonic dynasty and everything. But the thing of, is that it also encompassed the Ethiopian people by saying, you know, the Ethiopian people are like the chosen people, or it's the chosen holy land, et cetera, et cetera. So this kind of, you know, this of course, you know, has a huge profound effect into this proud aspect that we have as Ethiopians and, you know, what our cultural or societal norms are and everything like that. And it really stems from those type of things. Um, I think one a great example is that, you know, amongst the nobles or like, we see a lot of like, even amongst the Christians is they have multiple wives you know, back in the day, right? Um, and I think that really stems from the idea of King Solomon because King Solomon had you know, hundreds of concubines, hundreds of wives and everything. So, um, so we see like how that past story, you know, really put a profound effect on the Ethiopian people in general. Yeah, that's funny you said that because a lot of them blame it on uh, Gurang Ahmed. They said that they were copying the Islamic practice after he had uh, invaded the country. I had never heard uh, that it was an homage no. to uh, King Solomon. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it was it was an homage. I think, uh, yeah, that I, we can talk. We'll talk about Grand Muhammad uh, another time. But yeah, there's also another historical thing that I want to address. 
in terms of Grand Muhammad, but not for another day. Um, That's good. So continuing on. Yeah, continue on. So, um, so that covers the Queen of Sheba. Um, so when we talk about Aksumite Empire, um, we really want to divide it into, I'd say, like five different categories. Um, so this was uh, uh, thanks to I did I didn't even find this paper. This friend found it for me, but they had this uh, archaeological uh, research done in this uh, place called the uh, Beta Sama. Sama'ite, or it's like in Tigrin or whatever, it means house of audience. And this is like near the area of Aksum, it's like east of Aksum. So um, the, that place and Yeha, uh, which we illustrated is in the, uh, they're both in Tigray, and this is pre Aksumite era. So we're looking at, you know, anywhere from 1000 BC to also like up to uh, 360 BC or so. So archaeological evidence was done in Yeha and uh, that uh, Beta uh, Sema'ite, Sema'iti. Uh, but what they basically found, you know, and we illustrated this from the previous uh, video, is that this uh, Yeha had the, you know, a temple dedicated to the Southern Arabian gods, which the Ethiopian people followed uh, for the most, for the most part. Um, yet the funny thing is this: that, that temple uh, site excavated at Yeha is only twenty-five percent done. They haven't done any more research regarding it and everything. So there's a lot more to be found and a lot more to, you know, um, to be told about the Ethiopian history and everything. And at Yeha, what, what what they're saying is that it used to be, you know, a part of the kingdom of Damat. Um, and the kingdom of Damat, um, which is mostly encompassing, you know, northern Ethiopia and uh, Eritrea, um, there's still like uh, a lack of uh, evidence <laughs> when it comes to the, what happened, how did it become, how did it, you know, transform into Aksum or so. And I like think it's not, it's not clear that whether yeah. it dissipated and then Aksum arose as unrelated yeah. events or whether yeah. Aksum ate Damod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, when it came to the original archaeological, ar archaeological evidence regarding this is that more so that Damat, you know, ceased to exist and then Aksum rose. But now from that paper, um, that what they're saying is that it maybe coincidentally happened, whereas, you know, Dhamma transformed into Aksum or Dhamma was still, you know, part of Aksum, Aksum just rose. So, uh, yeah. And then one of the main confusions that we have, and we'll see this in the Aksumite era as well, is this whole abbreviation of like rulers. Um, so we don't know like what the full name of the rulers for um, and what they found, you know, from these, you know, transcriptions like Yeha, et cetera, is that, um, you know, the kings of Dalamat uh, also bear the, you know, the title of like, uh, it's like MLKN or Milk, Milken. And then also- uh, So let's pause here, let's pause here. For, yeah. for those who don't understand, I hope this is true. Most, let me say, if not all the Semitic tongues besides the ones found in Ethiopia did not historically have vocalizations. Yeah. There are dots and other things that are added to Hebrew and Arabic centuries after these languages are in use. And Gez is no different. And the Gez alphabet is the basis of the, the alphabets in Ethiopia. And so around the 300s, which we'll get to, we see vocalization and, and what that means is our alphabet used to just be like 30 plus consonants and that's it and you have to guess how to figure out what the vowel is but it, beginning yeah. in the 300s we start seeing the seven columns which we see nowadays which goes a u e a e e o or a u e a e e o and it's very much delineated each consonant has a, a, a variation and the, the actual letter changes so that we know the vowel as opposed to the dot systems of Arabic and Hebrew and, and Syriac and other versions of, of Aramaic. So what you're saying is in this time period, before the 300s, right, we had just consonants. And so that makes it difficult to know how the names of these people are pronounced. MLK, for example, depending on how you vocalize it in Hebrew, could mean either angel or king. And those are two very different words. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for that uh, description, Hanok. Um, yeah, so when it comes to those, uh, you know, kings of Dama, they're also like LMN, RBH, RDM. Um, 
and they also bear the title of like uh, Mukarib, or it's like of Dalmat and like Saba. And the Saba, Saba was a political entity in uh, Southern Arabia, which uh, we briefly covered um, in the other video. And also what they said is that they call themselves the, the YGDYN, which is possibly means that they like uh, uh, alluding to like they're the tribe of this or the tribe of that. Um, so that's pretty much the kingdom of Damat. There isn't, there still needs to be a lot of research done. Hopefully it will be done, you know, in our <laughs> lifetimes, I would hope at least. Uh, but yeah, so after the kingdom of Damat or so, and this is around, you know, after, you know, 400 or, you know, 300 BC, we start to get into proto-Aksum, um, or the start of Aksum in a sense. And when it comes to the proto-Aksum era, uh, most of this, um, archaeological evidence or just evidence in general comes from uh, Beta Gurgis and Aksum. And this is like a, it's a little north, it's like a hill in, uh, near Aksum or in Aksum. And um, just like I alluded to earlier, you know, they had the most recent, you know, evidence from uh, Beta <coughs> Sema Iti or House of Audience, in, uh, which, I mean, which means House of Audience in Tigrinya. So what these uh, excava uh, excavations show is, you know, they have like elite tombs, like, you know, these grandiose tombs. Uh, different administration, uh, administrative devices, um, and the remains of like a monumental building on top of uh, the Beit Gyorgis Hill to the northwest of Aksum. Um, and this can mean like just numerous things, you know, just tools in general, like, you know, so this could be like a plate or something like that, um, and uh, et cetera, whatever just comes to your mind as simple things. And what they found at the Beta uh, Sema Eti is offer, it also offer, offers, you know, new insight into Ethiopia's ancient and complex societies. Um, and what I was alluding to is that, you know, now the, the research is showing is that it's more so that these things evolved into Aksum or they were part of Aksum. And this town is our city, especially, was still very active during the Aksumite period. And, you know, during the time of, you know, uh, Izana or Kaleb, uh, it was still, you know, had a role in the Aksumite Empire. So that's what the, you know, research was showing and everything. And um, <clears throat> one thing that also, uh, this is a, a separate thing, this is coming from the Egyptians. Uh, we get, you know, our history from the Egyptians is that there is also, you know, there was like trade or, you know, capturing of elephants going on by the Egyptian uh, uh, Potolemies, like the uh, Potolemic uh, dynasty, probably butchering that, but and this was occurring around the fourth century BC. So what happened is the Egyptians were capturing um, elephants and trading uh, with Ethiopians and everything for around 100 years during that time. Um, but the issue was that the Egyptians, you know, trading, I mean, capturing, going down to Ethiopia to capture elephants uh, in that area was a, you know, quite a hassle, it cost a lot of money. So uh, they stopped um, doing it so. But uh, one also important thing that they mentioned in their, you know, hieroglyphics or like uh, their writing is that, you know, this was, they mentioned the creation of the port of Adulis, like, and Adulis was a very significant port, which is in Eritrea, uh, right, modern day Eritrea, but Adulis was the most significant port during the Aksumite period. Uh, so that's what we find in terms of uh, proto-Aksumite um, uh, uh, research or, you know, historical evidence and so, uh, yeah. So the next part now is, you know, uh, early Aksumite history. So this kind of encompass, you know, 80 BC to 160 AD or so. So uh, what we talked about earlier is that there was a lot of, you know, when it comes to Ethiopia, we're not only looking at Ethiopia or Aksum. What we're looking at is like Djibouti, we're looking at Eritrea, we're looking at Sudan, we're looking at Egypt, we're looking at a lot of Southern Arabia, which is, you know, compass like, Yemen, uh, South Arabia, uh, uh, Kingdom of Southern Arabia, or uh, uh, Oman, like all these different uh, countries in Southern Arabia now. So when we look at Ethiopia's history, especially in these early stages, is that it really encompasses all these, you know, different political entities that were during that, you know, stages. So one of the, you know, main, uh, one of the main two, you know, political entities during that time was there was the state of like Mero or like the Mero kingdom or the, it's also known as the kingdom of Kush. Um, and this like, this, uh, and these people were Nubians, you know, uh, and for those that don't know, Nubians are originally of Kushitic stock, but they speak a Nilotic language. Um, 
So these Nubians, they had, uh, it's just, there's so much history re with regards to Ethiop Ethiopia and everything. And they also had like different, you know, political shifts and as any other uh, country would. Uh, and they were even called Ethiopians by the Greeks. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they were even called Ethiopians. You know, the Ethiopian name is very uh, vast. <laughs> but yeah, so this is found in like modern day Sudan. And then the other, you know, main power uh, is also the kingdom of Saba and the kingdom of Himyar and um, Southern Arabia. Uh, so the, what was, what transpired into Aksum becoming so great was also like a political, uh, the political f fall or, you know, the weakening of these two, you know, states, uh, Saba and uh, Bero. And due to this, you know, the falling of these two states, Aksum was able to rise up as well. It was easier for them to rise up. And um, so what this also showed during this time, this uh, uh, early Aksum time is also connections with Rome, like the Roman Empire. And the reason why there was connections with Rome was that there's, uh, the, there's the Beja people, which are in Eritrea and uh, Sudan now, the Beja people would uh, raid Egypt, uh, you know, the southern Egypt and everything, which the uh, Romans were in control of during that, that uh, time period. So the Romans were seeking to have Ethiopians like, or the Aksumites, you know, help out with their, you know, Beja issue and everything. And what we find is that when the Bejas were controlled by the Aksumites or like, you know, their pay tribute and everything, the raids would cease against the Egyptians or Romans. Um, and what also happened is that there's also the issue of piracy that the Romans and the Ethiopian or Aksumites were dealing with. So this piracy, you know, would encompass the whole Red Sea and, you know, a lot of trade goes on and everything like that. So this affects the whole trade route, you know, because it goes all the way from Rome to Aksum and then all the way to India and even China. So um, this was like a common goal that both the Romans and the Aksumites uh, wanted to deal with um, in order to, you know, secure, you know, their economic growth and everything like that. And um, besides the Romans, what we also want to look at is the Greeks as well. Um, one thing that's always, you know, mentioned about Aksum is that, you know, Greek was widely used uh, amongst the royalty, especially. Um, Including and, Greek gods, although yeah, there are Greek. questions to the origin of those those gods, which is important. We haven't mentioned yet that this is before Aksum, because nowadays people think Aksum, they think Christianity. This is the time in which it was various pagan gods and goddesses being worshipped by the Aksumite kingdom. Yeah, exactly. Um, so... When it comes to Greek, um, Greek you know, the Greeks rule, especially like Alexander the Great, you know, is very, you know, very vast. Uh, so this, you know, encompassed the whole Mediterranean and everything. So what happened maybe is a possible explanation as to why Greek became um, so prevalent in Ethiopia is that Greek merchants or people that learned Greek um, just went into Ethiopia or were trading there and somehow the language transpired into going all the way to the Ethiopian royalty. And one of the reasons why Greek was maybe used, and we also see this with Sa uh, uh, Sabian, uh, the Sabian language from the kingdom of Saba, both these languages um, were maybe used uh, because Giz wasn't developed enough um, for the royalty to maybe, you know, use it full-fledged as the national language or et cetera. So, but it's, you know, rather, I would, it's probably more so that reason why we use Greek or Sabian is due to the lack of, you know, development. Like Henoko was talking about that lack of like vocalization and everything. Um, so that's why maybe Greek was used. Uh, I, that's the only other hypothesis. I mean, only hypothesis that I have or from what I've read. No, that's good. Like what you said, it was what English is today. It was the yeah. lingua franca because yeah. of Alexander the Great. That's the same reason that the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was translated into Greek in the city of Alexandria, which is a part of the Egyptian empire, uh, and was its intellectual epicenter, was the intellectual epicenter for the world for a long time. They had, you know, 70 elders or so, which is where the name comes from, translate those books into Greek for that reason. If you were hip, if you were, you know, one of the intelligentsia, if you were one of the elites, it's good to know Greek the same way now if you learn, um, they call it masaltan. They, they think that you are very educated. You're an elite if in today in Addis Ababa, if you speak English.
Sometimes mm -hmm. even if you uh, butcher your Amharic to speak English, to flex whatever English you know. So in the same way, in this time period, Greek was seen as the learned language. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's a very good <laughs> connection to uh, present day. Uh, so to, yeah, but to continue off of actually, you know, switching topics, now we look into um, the classo, classic Aksumite era. So this can be anywhere from 160 to 300 AD. So in the beginning of this era, um, see is that you know Aksum starts to try to exert its power over southern arabia or its rule over southern arabia so as i talked about earlier there was two main kingdoms the sabian and the himyar kingdoms and around 183 ad uh, both these kingdoms were at war against each other so what ended up happening is the 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 Aksumites, uh, got involved against the himyars and as the uh, sorry, um, let me reiterate that. So the Sabians sought help from the Aksumites in order to deal with the Himyars because they didn't want to, you know, lose against the Himyars everything. So this alliance happened for around you know five to seven years, and it concluded around 190 AD. And at the end of this, the Sabians and the Aksumites were victorious. But what ended up happening for uh, unknown reasons is that. This alliance ended up dissolving, and when the Ethiopians cap captured the Himyar captain, capital of Zafar in the ensuing years, the Sabians and the Himyars uh, ambushed the Aksumites. So, and then after two decades or so, the Aksumites ended up regaining the, their forces and defeating the Sabians and Himyars, and then thus, you know, securing dominance over uh, Southern Arabia. So this is, you know, a typical thing in human history. You know, we have a bunch of political shifts. Um, allegiances change depending on, you know, what the political elite want. And so that's what we saw. And in the end, you know, Aksum uh, succeeded. So uh, changing gears, uh, I want to talk about more about the terms, you know, Habesha and Ethiopia. And we talked about this in some, in some detail um, in the previous videos. But, you know, these are terms that we always use <laughs> as Ethiopians. Oh, I'm a proud Ethiopian. I'm proud mm -hmm. Habesha. But it seems we don't understand the terms. And I remember one time... Uh, at a, it was a good Jan Fadlaka Gion meeting. Um, this we were using the term Habesha, and someone asked, you know, what does Habesha mean? And this one uh, person uh, stood up and said, "Oh, Habesha basically means like the N word for Ethiopians." And I stood there, just I was just sitting. You know, he's an elder man, so I can't, you know, say anything. But I just I was just infuriated <laughs> by that, you know, ill ill comment. Um, and that's because you know we don't know. You know, simple terms that we always use. Uh, so when it comes to Habesha, um, the Habesha is just, it's just the tribe of, you know, it's just a tribe, like it's called the Habesha people. And the Habesha, you know, were a tribe that were in Southern Arabia, <clears throat> Southern Arabia, and then migrated into Ethiopia anywhere from 1000 BC to 2000 BC or so. So as to the common connotation of what Habesha means as a word, you know, once one uh, sources say or point to, you know, they were like incest traders or or users of incest. But uh, in terms of that, in terms of a definition, I wouldn't really put too much, you know, uh, emphasis on that really per se, more so that, you know, it was a, just a group of Southern Semitic people or, and then it evolved into Ethiopian Semitic people. And so that's, that's pretty much what is, I, I, or Habesha, what it comes to be. And when it comes to Habesha, um, <clears throat> we have a, also this, um, I, th I think we have this multifaceted def definition when it comes to Habesha in terms of modern days. Um, you know, when we say Habesha it usually alludes to the Ethiosemitics, like most specifically the Amaras or Tigrayans. And I think one misconception that we might have is that you know, when it comes to the Amaras or Tigrayans, is that during the Aksumite period, even before that, is that they mixed heavily with the Agos and the Bejas and these Kushida groups. So when we talk about Habesha, we should be really alluding to who was around, um, you know, during the Aksumite period. Or, and this could be like the proto Amaras, the proto Tigrayans, uh, Bejas, Agos, you know, uh, and other, you know, Afaras. These are the really, you know, you would say these are Habesha groups or Habesha, or really actually Habesha groups as they mixed with each other. And thus it, you know, became a Semitic and Kushidic, you know, 
and flow with, uh, with both groups. So when it comes, that's really how we should use the term or how we should define Habasha instead of this conservatory, you know, use of just this amadas or tikkudis because it's not really, um, I don't think it's, you know, defined as well when it, uh, defined as well as using, you know, a more broad approach. Yeah, so you're, so going back to what we said, there are, you know, there are so many different names we can use, but the kind of big picture groups are Semitic, Cushitic, and Nilotic. And what you're saying is for 2000 years, the majority, if not all of the people who are alive today are some mix of those Cushitic and Semitic people, uh, not referring to the Nilotics ones. Is there, is there for you even such thing as, a, you know, a largely or less, you know, less Cushitic culture? Is that, is, is that even possible? Like if you go to the Eritrean highlands and the Tigrinya speakers there, I think we could say pretty confidently that during the Oromo expansion or migration, they didn't quite make it there to mix so much. Mm -hmm. But there are other Cushitic people that were there <laughs> in in, yeah. in that area. Is there is there any part? Um, you know, sometimes they they try to do it by skin tone. They try to say Semitics are are more lighter skinned and and Cushitic are more darker skinned. In Gwandar, as one example, I've I've seen people point to some of the Samain Kifil people. Typically, Welkait and Wagara tend to be lighter skinned, whereas some of the South Gondarians on the the border of Gwajam, where there would be a, a stronger old uh, Go presence, they, they claim are, are, are darker. Is, is there such thing as more or less, or, or you just want to, you know, blanket the term for everyone because it's, it's hard to, to tell the difference unless everybody, you know, submitted their DNA somewhere. I think it's hard to blank, blank I mean, um, hard to really be precise. You know, when it comes to skin color, I think that's a very poor use. Uh, <laughs> of determining, you know, whether mo what someone's more Cushitic or Semitic. If you look at the, the summit, Southern, uh, these people, I forgot their names, but in Southern Arabia, they have these like pretty much, you know, close, very, you know, Semitic uh, gene orientated uh, Arabs. Like these are their original Arabs and like their genetics. Are you is, talking, uh, sorry, modern day, like Yemen modern or day, modern, modern day, day Saudi Arabia. Arabia? Yeah, modern day Yemen, sorry, modern day Yemen. So these, these people are 71% um, uh, what you call it, Semitic. Um, so they have very minimal from, you know, actually like compared to the rest of the Arabs because the Arabs are uh, mutts there. They mix with a lot of different people. Um, so when it comes to these Yemen, uh, Yemenites, they, some of them are very dark, like <laughs> they are dark. Um, so you can't really, you know, have this say, oh, one, because one's lighter than there's more Semitic. I, I really, that's a, I think that's a very ill-used definition of what it means to be Semitic or Cushitic. You have to look at the genetics of, you know, that specific human being. And, you know, then you can determine how Semitic or Cushitic they are. Uh, okay, generally. I, I've seen people born of the same two parents, opposite ends of the skin tone, where, for example, I you know, I know someone close to me where the parents are pretty much, you know, my skin tone, which you'd either call... Uh, a dama or the darker side of of a i would like to say a dama which is uh you know kind of red boned in the english uh, lexicon american english lexicon especially black english but the the other two people the the products of those two parents one is darker than both parents and the other is lighter than both parents and so i'm i'm with you on that 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 skin tone at best is a vague clue and at worst is like a total misnomer. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. Uh, so going back, <laughs> we uh, defined Habasha. So let's, uh, let's define Ethiopia. So, and, and, and sorry, briefly, Habasha yeah. is also one of those terms you're talking about that we first find consonantally, right? On those inscriptions. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like H H B S H T or whatever. You find that in like the inscriptions and everything. Um, so, when it comes to the term Ethiopia, um, it's interesting. I think one question that could be raised is, you know, why didn't we use, you know, Ethiopia? Why is it always referred to as the Aksumite Empire instead of like, you know, Ethiopian Empire? Uh, so I think this is just a hypothesis. I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, don't, don't hold me to it. But I think when it comes to Ethiopia, when we see one of, one of the common things that the Aksumite emperors did was that they would say, 
oh, I am the king of Habashat, I am the king of Saba, I am the king of Himya, I am the king of Beja. So they would list all these different, you know, political or like people entities as the people that they rule. And one thing that was also found, you know, in terms of that is they would say, I am the king of Habasat and I am the king of Ethiopia. So, you know, what, what does that mean? You know, so why, why is it say, oh, I'm the, <clears throat> why is like the king of Ethiopia, you know, mentioned alongside, you know, these different, you know, political entities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and again, sorry, quick aside, this is from which, you know, Habasha is also from which we get from the Anglo world that, that ruled almost everything, right? The term Abyssinian and Abyssinia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Abyssinia is just a, yeah, just, it's just the European term for Habasha. Uh, but anyway, so when it comes to Ethiopia, uh, what one possible, you know, claim is that you can say, and we alluded to this in like Genesis 2.13, where it talks about and the name of the second river, the one that encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia, and to this day, the Nile Springs are called uh, Gion. So, uh, as we know, this is uh, a lot of Ethiopians, you know, or like the northern Ethiopians believe in this, especially Gojamis. We all believe in this that you know this is alluding to Goja. So, when we talk about Ethiopia, what we can say is Proto Ethiopia is possibly you know Goja. Uh, so, one of the lands that you know the Aksumite emperors ruled was you know Goja. So, you know, this, that's why they would say you know King of Ethiopia and everything like that. Um, and one a side note about, you know, when the emperors list, you know, king of this, king of that, what we see is that sometimes it would just disappear, like, out of nowhere. And what we have is, like, for example, like, in Izana, he would say, like, king of Bejas or something. And then for another, like, 100, 200 years, the inscriptions won't say anything about Bejas. And then randomly, it would just pop up, like, during, you know, Caleb's time and say, oh, king of Bejas too. So, like, these inscriptions, like, there's a lot of gaps in it. And we can positively assume that like Abejas or if, if we don't see them being ruled during a certain period is that they were most likely maybe paying tributes or something. But for some reason, the inscriptions just don't have it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and also when it comes to, you know, the usage of the term Ethiopia, when it comes to the Greeks, uh, one thing that people always say is uh, the Greek, or uh, Ethiopia comes in the term, you know, Greek term of Aetopis or whatever. And it means uh, burnt face. Um, so what, what's interesting is that the Greek, you know, definition doesn't really align for the most part with how Ethiopia is described by the Greeks. And when we talk about Greek writers, mainly, you know, Homer and Herodotus, Ethiopians are put like, and more so in a positive light. And it doesn't really, it doesn't add up in the sense, you know, why would you describe people in these positive light, but you have this, you know, burnt skin face kind of definition. And this was alluded to. Another possible definition that might exist uh, is that was pushed forward by Edward Ullendorf and Contini, uh, Contin Rossini, and these are two main, like two main European scholars on Ethiopia, is that you know Ethiopia, you know, one of the possible definitions that Aetopia actually means, you know, sparkling or brilliant and slash, you know, red or fiery. So these are more positive connot- connotations of the term Ethiopia in terms of, you know, if we're saying that it comes from Greek. Uh, Either way, it's it's discuss it's discussing descriptively whether positively yeah. or negatively the skin tone of the peoples, which is how we see Ethiopia described in the in the Old Testament, especially yeah. the Greek of the the Old Testament. You know, the one of the famous lines of the the scroll of Jeremiah says like the spotted leopard or the cheetah, whatever the translation of that cat like animal is can't change its spots just like the ethiopian can't change his skin tone and you know it's one of the 50 places in the in the old testament or in the bible writ large uh rather that we that we see the the name come up so so it's interesting that whether positively or negatively in both cases it's it's referring to how you know the appearance of these people yeah exactly as opposed to something like agazian uh, which means like the free people, which is more not their appearance, but kind of the the trait or the characteristic characteristic behavior of the people. Yeah, yeah, and that goes back to like Habashat, like more like the ancestral or whatever, like a characteristic of the people, uh, per se. Uh, so when it comes to the Greek definition um, of Ethiopia, Aetopis, um, I personally don't use it. I don't, I don't, I don't believe the term Ethiopia comes from Greek. 
I think it was much more historic than that. And uh, yeah, but I mean, that's one possible interpretation if you choose to look that way of, you know, what Aitopis means and everything. So uh, the next part that I want to get into is, you know, Judaism. Uh, as we alluded to earlier, you know, the Queen of Sheba, oh, one thing I forgot to mention is that the Queen of Sheba converted to Judaism uh, due to the fact that King Solomon was a Jew. And what we see is like, I think one interesting question that can be brought up is that, okay, you know, the Queen of Sheba, you know, converted to Judaism. Why are we still using, if you look at Aksumite inscriptions, as Hanok alluded to, we talk about Greek gods and we're talking about Southern Arabian gods. And it's like, why, why is Judaism just not even mentioned really, you know? And when it comes to this a possible reason as to why Judaism just did not, you know, have a profound effect is more so I think due to the fact that Judaism is a religion that's really meant for Jews, like the Jewish or Israeli people. And if it doesn't, and the and that resonance that occurs just with the Jewish people probably didn't have a profound effect on the Ethiopian people. Um, so we see this religion kind of dissipating. It's still like in Ethiopia during the Aksumite period and everything like that. And of course, you know, it's still today with the Beit Israel and everything, but we see that it didn't really have the trickle down effect uh, that Judaism, you know, or any other like other religion when it comes to Christianity or Islam, you know, had on the people. And another factor that also might come into play is that there wasn't, you know, a positive reinforcement of the religion itself. Um, when it there's comes, no, to there's no evidence of it being the state enforced religion like yeah, Islam yeah. is in caliphates and like Christianity was yeah. in the Aksumite period. Yeah. Um, there was no positive reinforcement because the thing about Christianity or Islam is that you will continually have like uh, traders or merchants or, you know, different uh, priests or, you know, who becomes a saint or you have different uh, religious leaders that continue to, you know, uh, evangelicalize or, you know, continue to teach the religion to all these different people. When it comes to Judaism, it didn't have that effect or there wasn't that kind of, you know, flow into Ethiopia where, you know, it, profoundly converted the people into Judaism. So that's why we see like the, the God, I mean, the uh, emperors and stuff or the rulers, they still alluding to, you know, gods of, of the Southern Arabians or gods of the Greeks and everything like that. So uh, that's one uh, thing that I wanted to address. Uh, another thing that we also want to look at is um, there's this one thing called the Peripolis of the Eritrean Sea, which is a, you know, it's pretty much a Greek document and it gives some details into what Aksum was at that time. And for those of you that might not know is that Eritrea, the term Eritrea comes from that. Like, um, so Eritrea literally means the Red Sea in like Greek, um, but- Red Sea, red people. See, and that, and that, that relates to that kind of fiery definition that you were saying yeah. about that. <laughs> and it's it related to the black English idea of having uh, red undertones or overtones or being red boned. So yeah. that that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. <laughs> so uh, from this work, um, and we don't even know, uh, a periplus is just like a written work uh, by, you know, uh, in Greek. So we don't know who even wrote it. It's just like an unknown traveler. So what these, uh, what it shows is that, you know, really how trade was flourishing in Adulis. And this is like, this is the time period of like around a zero to 100 AD. And so during this time, the reign, uh, the trader that went, it was uh, the emperor that was ruling was uh, Zoskalis, or also named as uh, Zihakad. So he was he always he was depicting how you know trade was occurring all the way from the Roman Empire to Southern Arabia and India, and of course you know it would take its place in Adulis as well in Aksum. And he also talks about how Zoskalis also, or the emperor, or the Aksumite uh, empire at that time ruled Suakin, alluding to north in northeast Sudan, up to there, and also in Berbera and Somaliland. So these are two, you know, important historical evidence as to how far, you know, the Aksumite empire was ruling at that time. So um, what we also have during this uh, time period, and now, you know, we're looking at, um, I would say, what, like just ox, classic Aksum. So this is from like 160 AD to 300 AD. So 
at this time around, you know, 280 or so, I mean, 200, like 60 AD or 270 AD, uh, Aksum really gains recognition as, you know, a world power. And I think uh, some people might know this is like, there's this prophet named Mani of uh, Persia, and he describes there are four great kingdoms on earth. Uh, the first being the Persian Empire or the Kingdom of Persia, the Roman Empire, uh, the, Chi the Chinese, you know, kingdom or empire, and then lastly, the Aksumite Empire. So at that time, there was... He's the founder, for those who don't know, of Manichaeism, which is the religion or philosophy that St. Augustine followed before being a Christian. And for those who have at least seen Star Wars, it's basically the Force. <laughs> uh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Um... <laughs> yeah, it's like an evil god and a, and a good god, and they're, they're always doing battle. So oh, if you, okay. you could think of it in terms of uh, Jedi and Sith. Okay, that, that's a that's a pretty <laughs> that's a pretty pretty cool description. Um, so comes to this time as well, uh, Aksum also began minting its own coins, um, and they were they were circulated with three different types of metals, you know, gold, silver, and copper. And this was a really significant point, as you know, in order to be at that time, in order to be a great nation or a great you know civilization, you have to mint. Like having your own currency shows alludes to how much power you have. So this is really like the stepping stone for like Aksum in terms of a political entity. And around this time, you know, shifting around 30 years later, around 300 AD, uh, go, coming back, uh, talking about Nubia, Nubia is always going to be a re reoccurring theme in Aksumite history, is that uh, Aksum really started to assert its political dominance over Nubia. And the Kingdom of Kush or the Merodic uh, Kingdom, uh, both names can be used, you know, uh, interchangeably, uh, they had their capital at uh, Mero. And what happened is that they were being disobedient towards the Aksumite emperor at the time and was probably uh, most likely infringing on Aksumite territory. So what happened is the Aksumite empire, an uh, emperor sent a huge military expedition and just utterly destroyed Mero. Like, and as a result, the kingdom of Kosh or the Mero kingdom really ceased to like that phase really ceased to exist at that time. Uh, and it took, you know, uh, um, like a century or so plus, you know, for the Nubians to gain some kind of footholding again. And who we know this emperor to be at the description of the Mero was most likely uh, given by Ella Amida. And for those of you that know Ella Amida, he's, or might not, I don't know Ella Amida. He was the father of Izana and Saizana. Uh, which would be who would become the leaders of Ethiopia, and what we see from in the and who you are named after, yeah, <laughs> and what we see uh, after uh, in his inscriptions um, as after an Aksumite emperor would destroy you know uh, a political entity or you know win in a war is that they would dedicate it to a, a god of some sort. So Ella Amida, you know, dedicated to the war god of Ares, uh, which is you know found in Greek. Which is also Ma Mars, Mars and Aries, Mars and Aries Latin versions. Exactly. God of War. Yeah. So um, this would be like really the. Actually, it wouldn't be the last time that an Aksumite emperor would uh, allude to uh, some uh, non-Christian entity, even after the rule of uh, Izana. So after El Amida, uh, and he, you know, had the children of Izana and Saizana, uh, Emperor Izana and also, Saizana ended up ruling, you know, Aksu. And he's probably the most well-documented after, you know, Kaleb about, you know, his ruling of uh, Aksu and everything. So, Emperor Izana and uh, Saizana, when they talk about what the, the area they're ruling and everything, they say, you know, the king of Aksu and Himyar and Raidan and Saba and Sahil and Habeshat and Siamo and Beja and Kasu. And Kasu is also Nubia. Um, so, this is just like the stereotypical listing that they do of all the different areas that they reign. And I think one thing that's not really alluded to is the fact that we talk about Izana all this time, but Saizana was, it was basically two de facto head of states at that time. Uh, Izana and Saizana ruled simultaneously. And one thing that is alluded to is that when uh, Emperor Constantinus uh, II addressed the Aksumite Empire, he wrote to the honorable brothers of Izana and Saizana. 
So this is, you know, recognizing that there's two, you know, political leaders of uh, Aksum, Ethiopia. And what we see is that in the list of kings uh, of Aksumite kings or kings of kings, we do not find the name of Izana as the, you know, the emperor at that time, but we find Abraha and Atzaha or Abraha wa Atzaha. And these are, you know, these are also names that Izana and Sai Izana used as it's common uh, for the kings of kings or emperors of Ethiopia or Aksum, you know, to have multiple names uh, for uh, just themselves, you know, so the Izana and uh, Izana and uh, Abraha, Atzaha and uh, Sai Izana and stuff. So, um, and they also discuss about, um, you know, when dealing with incursions by the Nubians or the Vejas and, uh, and et cetera, that Izana would send Sai Izana and their other brother, they also had another brother named Hadifas uh, to fight these, um, middle, uh, these incursions and successfully always defeat them. So that's, you know, really the political history of, uh, you know, our, of what, what was going on with Izana and Sai Izana. I think the most important thing that we talk about in general is also, you know, the influence of Christianity, what happened during that time. And, you know, to give a brief overview is that, you know, how Christianity came into Ethiopia. So when we talk about this, um, Christianity had like multi, like it was multiple ways that it said that it first came to Ethiopia, the initial stages. Um, and the first story really is about the Ethiopian Anuk or the servant to the royal court, whose also name was Bakos, who was the treasurer of uh, Queen Candace or Hindeke. Um, and it said that he went to Jerusalem and he met with one of the 12 apostles or St. Fa Philip the Evangelist. And once meeting him, Bakos was converted to Christianity and brought it back to Ethiopia around 34 AD. And this is stated in Acts 8, 26 uh, to 40. Uh, and then one thing mentioned importantly about the validity of this is regarding in terms of Queen Candace or Queen Hendeke. Um, and one thing that's, you know, alluded to is, you know, are we talking about, because Queen Candace is, is just uh, um, a European term for the the rulers of Mero or the, the Mero, the kingdom or kingdom of Kush at that time. Yes. Yeah. Which we, spoke, of, which we spoke about earlier uh, as a more inland uh, more modern day Sudan entity uh, than Aksum. At the same time, you talked about how the borders 2000 years ago were very different than they were now. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. So when it comes to, you know, Queen Candace, uh, the validity of it being an Ethiopian ruler, um, I mean, I wouldn't say it's, it's more points towards being a Nubian ruler, uh, but we also have to understand that, you know, he's that we, I kept alluding to is the close cooperation or the close, you know, rule of like all like Nubia or Ethiopia or, you know, the Southern Arabian kingdoms. So there's always, you know, mixture going on or like, uh, just like everything, like the political entities are like separate, but not separate at the same time. Um, and, you know, this is power shifts and everything like that. So maybe, you know, after Bakos was converted, um, Maybe he sent an entourage to Ethiopia that was Christian. Who knows? Uh, we can make, you know, maybe that's a possible hypothesis. Uh, but there's also, you know, other stories about how Christianity originally came to Ethiopia. And the second is how Ethiopian and Jewish pilgrims uh, were present on the day of Pentecost in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and this, you know, event is celebrated 50 days after Easter. And so these Ethiopian Jew uh, Jews uh, heard uh, when St. Peter was preaching about Christianity uh, in Jerusalem. And after hearing his preaching, they, they converted to Christianity and came back and spread Christianity in Ethiopia. So this is one possible story. Another st story is the third story of St. Matthew, one of the 12 apostles who visited Aksum and you know, preached about Christianity as well. And the fourth story, which is not really a story, is that you know Christianity spread due to the extensive trade Ethiopia was part of. Um, and this is obvious uh, due to the, or this is a most likely explanation due to the fact, you know, trade, like we've alluded to is that, you know, it goes to the Roman Empire, goes to Southern Arabia, goes to Ethiopia, goes to India. So Christianity might have been one of the things that spread along, so uh, spread along those, you know, traders or merchants to the common people as well. Uh, so that's, you know, the possible ways Christianity came into Ethiopia, you know, initially.
but when we talk about you know Christianity Ethiopia, there is the main aspect of how it like really you know uh, cemented its fa it cemented it was a cemented religion into Ethiopia, and that's stories of course of uh, Fermentius or Fermanatos, and the story of Fermanatos really starts with the story of um, Moropis, and Moropis was a trader of uh, Tyre, and Tyre is in you know modern day. Uh, do you want to say something, Hanok? Or? No, no, go ahead. You were going to say modern day Lebanon. Yeah, modern day Lebanon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's found in modern day Lebanon, and what it was happening is that when he was traveling back from India uh, with his two relatives, which are you know his two relatives, relatives were obviously you know young the young Christian brothers are Fermanatos and uh, Sidrakos or Sidrakos. Um, they were ambushed uh, by pirates and they were stopped in some part of the Red Sea, probably I'd release in Eritrea, and uh, to get some materials. And they were just and, killed. And it's the part of Eritrea, which is now, you know, in this area where Eritrea, Djibouti, and Ethiopia, which you said is in our purview all have these Afar people who've been these nomadic people, and especially this time before the rise of Islam. Uh, I I would guess it's some type of uh, relation to them. I, oh, yeah. That's just pure conjecture on my part. But even nowadays, there are some areas where, you know, you better watch out. You know, I, I don't know how closely governed they are. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely what it is. And we're actually, we'll allude to the Afars in a little bit. Um, so what happened is, uh, I don't want to make the assumption of the Afaris, I love the Afaris. So what happened is uh, Moropis was killed by these uh, pirates or barbarians and all the ship members included were killed, but only the two boy, young boys were saved. So what happened is they were spared and somehow they were brought to the royal courts of Emperor Ella Amida, which is of course the father of Izana and Saizana. And the emperor was, you know, very impressed by the, the brothers. And he and he eventually made Fermanatos his uh, treasurer. And I, I oh, sold, sold into slavery, right? Into of the of the palace. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, they were treated nicely, you know. So <laughs> yeah, different different than chattel slavery of North America, but still the common worldwide institution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so Fermanatos was made his uh, treasurer and Odysseus was his cupbearer. But once uh, Ella Abida died, uh, they were granted freedom. They were about, both about uh, allowed to leave. But the empress or his wife, you know, begged both of them to stay. And uh, they their stay would, you know, eventually evolve into them educating Saizana and Izana and eventually converting them both uh, to Christianity. So once they were both converted to Christianity and made the state of the, the religion, uh, the state religion of Ethiopia or Aksum, um, they needed to gain legitimacy. So uh, in order to gain legitimacy, Fermanatos he visited the Coptic Church in Alexandria, where he requested a bishop for Ethiopia, and the patriarch at the time, uh, Ant uh, uh, Antanasius the uh, first, made Fermanatos the bishop as Ethiopia. And gave him the name of Abu Salam Burhan. And for the context of the greater Christian world, Athanasius of Alexandria, he's the guy who was deposed four or five times, exiled for like 45 years, fighting the Arian heresy his whole life. C.S. Lewis wrote an introduction to his book on the incarnation where he defended the anti-Arian uh, position. Uh, but based on uh, Neoplatonism rather than more of the parabolic tradition of, of, of the Syriac language, because he was firmly a, a Greek speaker of Alexandria, Egypt. He's also the guy who watches over the council that determined the first 27 books of the New Testament to be the New Testament as, as we know it. And so that, like uh, Izana is saying, connects Ethiopia to, the, to all of Christendom at the time where the New Testament was being considered the New Testament. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, so uh, going, you know, going back to Emperor Izana and Saizana. So of course their rule of, their rule was the first peak of Aksu really. Um, the second peak would be during Khalid. So uh, of course during the, the reign, you know, just 
the the political entity of Oxum, you know, really, you know, con asserted its control over the areas that we've previously alluded to, like Southern Arabia, Sudan, Djibouti, um, uh, modern day Eritrea, you know, like half of modern day Ethiopia as well. Uh, and what we see is after their deaths, um, there's not that much resources regarding, you know, the real, like fifth, for the most part, the fifth century of Aksumite history, as well as the, the later parts of the fourth century. And we have five emperors that are inscribed uh, who ruled after Izana and Saizana. And these emperors were listed as Asfaha, Arfid, Amiz, Al Adoba, and El Amida II. But they aren't really that well documented. Um, what we do know for uh, what was going on during that time is that coin production was still occurring. Uh, but the emperor really had a slump in their somewhat slump of their rule until the advent of Izana II and Caleb. Um, and one important thing that was imp uh, going around, going on around this time that we do have resources, you know, is the advent of the, the nine saints. And for to give a brief description of the nine saints, the nine saints were people who, you know, had the same, you know, orthodoxy faith as the Ethiopians and disagreed with the Council, uh, Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD that um, transcribed into the difference of beliefs regarding uh, Jesus's divinity and humanity. Um, so what happened is these, uh, these uh, followers of Christianity or followers of the, or, you know, of the Orthodox faith ended up going to Ethiopia as they knew that's what the Ethiopians followed and they wouldn't be persecuted in, uh, by the Ethiopians whatsoever. And, and to pause here for those, uh, I've had people write to me alarmed when they read about this because they read that they're Roman and they freak out. They're like, what are you saying that the Italians colonized us from back then? So just for people to get a, a, a bit of picture, they're from the Eastern Roman Empire, which is Byzantium, but the Middle East, the same Levantine, the Levantine, the, the Eastern Mediterranean area. The same area that we talked about, modern day Lebanon, modern day Syria. So sometimes they're called Greco Syrians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and they were really like mixed backgrounds. You can't really say, like, they were Syrians. They were um, just, not, like you said, the whole different, like, Levant, uh, you know, people at that time. So they weren't, they definitely weren't just Romans or anything. <laughs> I've never heard of that. That's, that's a funny. Uh, Someone wrote to me. Someone wrote to yeah. me because they read some article. I don't know where it was. It was like some BuzzFeed or Vox like article where yeah. it said uh, the Romans introduced Christianity to Ethiopia. And then it was like, oh, is it Italians? Uh, you know, is Italians from back in the day? I was like, no, these are not Italians. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. So um, these nine saints, um, yeah, but they were very important uh, in terms of spreading Christianity in Ethiopia. The most uh, interesting thing is that they were really secluded into Aksum um, in terms of their monasteries and where they resided after spreading the faith. Um, so, you know, each had their own monastery and everything. I think the most, you know, uh, uh, prominent church that we know is, you know, Dabradamo in Tigray. Um, and that one is, you know, where you have to climb all the way up on a rope, like sketchy stuff. But this is, you know, that's a that's a monastery or a church that has been around since the time of, you know, the nine saints and everything. And not only did they spread Christianity, uh, but they also, you know, really started the life of being a monk or monastic life. Um, and they also performed many miracles, uh, converted numerous Ethiopians, and they also, you know, finished off what uh, Fermanatus started which is translating the Bible into Giz and, um, and other numerous uh, religious texts uh, of the Ethiopian church. And each of these, you know, uh, um, saints are, of course, you know, they have their own day of, in the church and, you know, their own uh, feast or whatever, uh, feast, etc. And, you know, praised all the time in our church. So very uh, important uh, people in the foundation of our Orthodox. Uh, Especially by St. Yarid, who comes after them. And yeah. he, he remembers them in his Dugwa, which is the main hypnography of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, just so we're <laughs> just going to, yeah, we're just going to go into Yared. So yeah, Yared, uh, 
was of course you know a saint in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Um, and the story is that when he was growing up and learning the traditional church school at the time, he was a very poor student. And <clears throat> he was punished by the preacher that was teaching him. And he ended up being getting so frustrated that he quit uh, his teachings. But upon quitting, when he was resting in uh, on a tree, or, tree, he's witnessed a worm or caterpillar. And this worm, that caterpillar, that you know, it kept trying and trying again to climb the tree in order to get the fruit uh, that it waste uh, that it wanted. And <clears throat> after seven tries, it finally succeeded. And Saint Yadid saw this as you know motivation that he had to you know keep on trying, and trying until he was successful in terms of our church uh, teachings. Uh, so he ended up going back to school and finished his studies and became a very you know successful learned man of the church. And uh, this is an interesting story in terms of Yadid is that uh, this was uh, I think a Luan alluded to I don't know if you know of Luan Malaku he is an assistant professor uh, at Addis Ababa but he talked about this. Um, so uh, Saint Yadid uh, he became a deacon and eventually a priest. And when he got married, he learned that his uh, wife uh, cheated on him. So since he learned that his wife cheated on him, he was determined to kill the lover of his wife. Uh, but for uh, God, of course, intervened and sent him three birds that showed him heaven and the beautiful music that was praising God. Yeah, here I want to pause because there are like, there are like three or four different accounts of yeah. St. Patty. <laughs> There are, there are some people uh, amongst the Likawant, amongst scholars, who want to say that he was monastic the whole time. There are some people who want to say he was married and stayed married. And then there are some that, uh, exactly as you said, he was married for a time. And then because of cheating, then, you know, lived a monastic life after that. And it, it goes to the point that we said, you know, preface a lot of what we're saying with uh, it's a hard it's a hard period to study historically, yeah. but we're, we're yeah. trying to present just a survey of things with the idea that everyone, you know, will do their own critical thinking and, and research using this as a launch pad. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree 100% with Hanok. Uh, yeah. So the, that's, the, that's the thing that we see a lot in Ethiopians, uh, especially when it comes to later periods uh, in terms of like what exactly happened. So, uh, uh, going back to you know Saint Yared or Kundus Yared, um, so once he heard this you know music from God, um, he said that he um, he started to create what he heard and gave it you know to the church, and it said that he, his voice was like a, of an angel and that it moved people so much that you know one time Emperor Gabrabeskal, who was the son of uh, Caleb or Emperor Caleb. Uh, stabbed Saint Yadid in the foot by accident, to which Saint Yadid didn't even realize because he was so like encompassed or memorized with the uh, you know God. So uh, that's you know one uh, stereotypical Ethiopian story that we have you know to put in light how great our uh, priests or you know emperors are um, or saints. So yeah, there are great icons of it too with the, yeah. <laughs> the spear thrust in his foot and the blood yeah. gushing out, and he's just like yeah. singing. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, St. Yared is the founder of Ethiopian you know, sacred music and hymns or Zema, uh, chanting the liturgical chant. Um, so really St. Yared is uh, who the Orthodox Church can thank for, you know, how to praise God uh, in numerous different ways. Uh, so going back, so St. Yared, you know, it was around like uh, the uh, sixth century, like 500, you know, past 525 AD or so. Uh, so I want to go back a little bit, um, and I want to talk about before the reign of Emperor Caleb or al -Azaha. So before the reign of Caleb, there was this other emperor by the name of Izana II or Tazena. And Izana is known, and this is around 480 to 495 uh, AD, but Izana is known for defeating the Aguazat uh, kingdom somewhere in northwest or northern Ethiopia. And Aguazat maybe possibly probably is Agos or something, because it sounds you know it sounds similar. Um, and this uh, this uh, de defeat of the Aguazat kingdom allowed you know Ethiopia to reconsolidate the power uh, in northern Ethiopia. Uh, as I mentioned, you know after the rule of Izana and Saizana, uh, Ethiopia I mean Aksum went in a kind of a slump. And he also defeated the tribes of the, the Danakil or the Afan tribe, which is most likely the Afars. 
And this was done as retribution for the Afar or Afan, you know, plundering of Aksum, Aksumite trade caravan, uh, which <laughs> Henek was talking about what they would uh, do. Uh, and I think we talked in our last video, I believe, about Lucy, a.k.a. Dinkanesh, her, her Neftang Yasim, yeah. uh, was found in that region that you're talking about. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and... Uh, in his expedition, he also reasserted his rule over the Noba, which is also another name for the Nubians. Uh, and this was done because they refused to recognize his rule. And he was trying to be really courteous and trying to, you know, be diplomatic. Uh, but when the Nubians, you know, refused to yeah, agree with him, he completely like pillaged the area they were, they were living in, collected uh, much booty, as they say, historically. Um, and yeah, so Izana was an important uh, figure before uh, Caleb. And what was interesting, like I was saying earlier, was this uh, Ella Amida's uh, thanks to Ares wasn't the last time an Ethiopian emperor praised thanks to someone else besides, you know, God, the main God of God. Or God. And in this, uh, in his inscriptions, he ded dedicated the wins to or the victories to Maharam or the Southern Arabian God. And this, you know, shows really, you know, why was there really a kind of a change and the royalty or specifically that emperor that self in terms of not really adhering to Christianity itself and instead going back, you know, reverting to Southern Arabian gods that previous uh, Ethiopian emperors followed. Uh, but we don't really have as a reason as to why that happened. And the effect was not um, grand or anything because uh, Christianity reasserted itself um, the reigns of Caleb and successive emperors. Um, but yeah, so after Izana, what we have is the reign of Caleb. Or, and during the reign of Caleb, this is when the Aksumite Empire hit another peak. Um, and it, it is said that his reign, or I mean, his reign was greater than Izana in, sense, in the sense of how many uh, kingdoms or political entities that were under his control. And he also expanded territory in uh, the Southern Arabia and going to areas such as uh, Najran, which is in present day uh, South Arabia. And and what was the, the main issue that was occurring in Southern Arabia at that time was uh, the conflict of two religions, uh, there be it, you know, Christianity and Judaism. So what happened is in terms of Judaism is that there was this man around the 515 or so by the name of Duo Nuas, uh, who di disposed the leader of the Himyar kingdom, made Judaism pretty much like a state religion for the Himyar kingdom, and started a war against the Christians in uh, Southern Arabia. And th this is basically, we talked to uh, like about Yodit or, you know, Grain and everything. This was really the first occurrence of like religious warfare or uh, in Ethiopian history in that, you know, in this aspect, you know, we see Christianity against Judaism. And Dua Nuas, you know, he burned many Christians, he burnt churches, and he was planning to massacre all the Ethiopians that were in Southern Arabia at that time, and told his Southern Arabian soldiers uh, to sleep beside each Ethiopian and behead them. So really uh, cool stuff. <laughs> so in response, what happened is Caleb, uh, Caleb, uh, of course, heard of like what was going on, and he sent an expedition of 70,000 men to contain uh, Dua Nuas. And what had what happened is Dua Nuas, realizing that he was surrounded and everything, fled to the, the mountains in order to, you know, escape, you know, being captured or killed. So as soon as this happened, Emperor Caleb uh, thought, you know, the fighting was pretty much over. Dua Nuas is not going to, you know, try to, you know, assert his rule again. And he just left back to Aksum and left his soldiers there. And his soldiers uh, were led under uh, the girl named Avraha. Upon hearing this, Duo Nuas uh, started attacking the Ethiopian garrison, and this prompted Caleb to come back and finally defeat uh, Duo Nuas. So after the defeat of Duo Nuas, as I said, um, Abraha was made the commander of the Ethiopian garrison in Southern Arabia. And this is an important aspect, um, um, as we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, so one aspect that I want to talk about during Caleb's reign was that you know, there was trying developments uh, between the Byzantine Empire and the Aksumite Empire to have like, you know, greater political connections or greater, you know, helping each other out uh, more so. 
And the reason being is that the Byzantines uh, sought help from the Aksumites uh, in order to free both from Persian control and the heavy tariffs they imposed on trade. As we know, you know, when we talk about Persia, you know, it's really the buffer state in between where Aksum was ruling in Arabia and where Byzantine was ruling in Eastern, you know, Europe or uh, 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 Eurasia area. But for some reason, you know, these things really didn't uh, materialize. Aksum didn't want to, you know, be on the bad side of Persia and thus the Byzantine Empire and Aksumite Empire never really got into a greater cohesion. So, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Abraha was made the commander of Southern Arabia. And Abraha, what he did is that he completely asserted his control because there was a new Himyar kingdom that uh, uh, Khalid put in power, but Abraha ended up disposing him and like said, you know, the Southern Arabian, uh, Southern Arabian entity was for himself. And upon hearing this, uh, Khalid was very furious, but what Abraha did was that he said his victories uh, were thanks to not only God, but also to the Aksumite Empire and submitted uh, to the emperor and continuously paid tribute uh, to Khalid. But, and one important thing that people might not actually know is that, you know, is that he sent an expedition of over 60,000 men to like, or soldiers to Mecca to destroy like the Ka'aba, like, which is, you know, the pilgrimage or the main shrine that Muslims go to uh, for their, like, uh, their pilgrimage or everything. And before, you know, Islam was uh, created by uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, this, this site in Mecca was a pagan, like, uh, site. It was a pagan uh, temple and everything. So in order to control, uh, control Southern Arabia even greater, Abraha sought to destroy this shrine and put all the people under his control. And he fought, you know, these other, um, uh, he fought like these other Southern Arabian people and like they, he defeated them easily. But what ended up happening that prevented him from destroying the, destroying, you know, Mecca was due to the fact that smallpox broke out amongst his army. And as a result, since smallpox broke up, broke out across, uh, across the army, he couldn't, you know, defeat Mecca or couldn't destroy Mecca. And after this, the, uh, after this, even Abraha still continued to live uh, for a decade or so. And after the death of Abraha, his two sons of Yaksum and Marsuk uh, continued to rule. But the height of Ethiopian dominance in Southern Arabia was starting to dissipate already as they didn't have the capacity or you know charisma to rule like their father did. And what ended up happening eventually is that uh, the half-brother of Yaksum and Marsuk uh, Saif uh, Duo Yazin uh, betrayed his two brother or betrayed his brother uh, of Marsuk and gained political support from the Persian Empire and thus uh, exerting Persian Empire control over Southern Arabia at that time. Uh, so, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so the next part that goes into this is that uh, talking about Islam. Uh, because after this, uh, the Southern Arabian uh, conquest and Abraha and everything, Islam was starting to take shape. Uh, and we see that really, you know, transversed into Ethiopia. Um, but so when it comes to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, you know, Islam first started around 610 AD or so. And uh, as probably many people know, the Prophet Muhammad was, you know, seen his belief or his Islamic belief was seen as like heretic teaching or, you know, was persecuted. Uh, the Southern Arabian rulers at that time or Persians did not like it. Um, and so, but he managed to gain a decent amount of followers and they converted to Islam. And in order to escape the persecution uh, for his followers, he sent them to Ethiopia. And the reason why he sent them to Ethiopia is because he supposedly had, you know, two maids or one maid, that were of Ethiopian origin, and he they were very kind people, and they would always talk about their home country, and so he had this perception of Ethiopia being a, a righteous uh, land. So when he sent approximately 100 of his followers to Aksum, he said, "If you go to Ethiopia, you will find a king under whom none are persecuted. It is a land of righteousness where God will give you relief from what you are suffering." 
So his followers were sent, and this was supposedly during the reign of Emperor Arama or Ella Samha. And but we are it's most likely Arma, but we still aren't really sure which emperor was ruling at that time. Um and what we find is that the inscriptions by the, the followers or the of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, um, they refer to the king as like the Najasi, uh, which is the you know the Arabic form of Nigus, uh, meaning king, of course. Yeah, they they typically uh, we call our alphabet Abu Gida. They say Abba Jada. They typically <laughs> turn the the G sound to a J. Uh, you would be surprised. It's not just an Arabic thing. Tigrinya yeah. speakers in Ethiopia do that too. We say Wangel in Gez and in Amharic, but oftentimes Tigrinya speakers, when their Tigrinya influences Gez, they'll say Wangel, uh, which sounds similar to the Amharic word for crime. So sometimes it leads for some some punniness. <laughs> yeah, uh, interesting. Um, so, so the rise of Islam, Ethiopia took in, uh, showed hospitality to the early followers, uh, the early Mohammedans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the, the the main people was the cousin of the prophet. Uh, his name was Jafar uh, Abi, Talib. and he explained to the emperor uh, Muhammad's teaching teachings. And the emperor was so touched, uh, so he granted political asylum uh, for those that followed Islam and everything. He he read from the chapter Maryam, and you yeah. know how much our people love Maryam. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, it brought a tear to his eye. Yeah, uh, so. Amongst hearing this, the prophet, even though he never visited Ethiopia, uh, he had great respect and admiration for Ethiopia, saying, uh, leave the Ethiopians in peace so long as they do not take the offensive. Uh, so what that meant is Ethiopia was exempt from jihad or Islamic uh, religious war, which you know it, it didn't hold up <laughs> in Ethiopia's history, unfortunately. Um, so this, you know, hijra, first hijra by the prophet, I mean, the prophet's followers is the most significant foundation of Islam itself. Um, and if it did not occur, you know, most likely, you know, the world's history might be different. You know, we might not even know of Islam or anything like that. So it was really due to Ethiopia's uh, kindness when it came to Islam that um, Islam, you know, succeeded and it became a you know dominant religion in the world. Um, <laughs> but what was funny is that the inevitable growth of Islam also led to the decline of Aksum itself. Um, as Islam, you know, it went through Southern Arabia like uh, crazy and just, you know, encompassed the whole Arab, uh, Arab land, it encompassed the whole Middle East and everything. And this really led to Aksum, Aksum uh, declining uh, as the, the Mites really couldn't assert their control over the Red Sea as they used to due to Arab control or Islam control. Additionally, they took over Egypt from uh, the previous Greek rulers and yeah. began the Arabization of, of Egypt, which is important for us because, as you had mentioned, we had originally gotten our, episc our episcopacy or the formal structure the, of bishops, priests, and deacons from that connection in Alexandria, Egypt. So, so now there's uh, a shadow over the connection in Egypt, and there's a shadow over the Red Sea, like you said, which had made us such a... a you know, that it had such a boom to our economy. Yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. So, I, and I, I, going back to that fact uh, you just alluded to, um, I, this was a main issue. Uh, one issue that we had is that we couldn't get like a, a bishop for our, our church. And this happened over like uh, five uh, patriarchs in the 900 AD or so. And this lack of a Coptic, you know, bishop or really. It has a really a moral morale effect on the Ethiopian people. Um, so if we if we don't have a a bishop or anything, we you know we start to decline because it's that belief in Christianity and everything. Um, and and let's pause here for a second because this is interesting. Ethiopia is known, you know, put Liberia aside because it was an American colony as the only African nation to have successfully resisted colonization and to have done it twice against the. Uh, monarchic Italy and against the fascist Italy, uh, against King Umberto and against uh, Mussolini, Benito Mussolini. With what is it that made Ethiopia resist? 
Well, some people point to it having 70% of Africa's highlands. Some people point to the fierceness and, and warrior-like nature of the Ethiopian people, which we may or may not relate to uh, Ares or Maharem. Sure. Other people point to the fact that it's the only Christian kingdom in all of Africa. Uh, oftentimes, I think the writers, people pick up this phrase, a uh, uh, Christian island in a sea of Islam, uh, let alone all the other pagan religions. Do you, do you have any sort of opinion, if we can get your uh, opinion hat on, on, you know, is it the highlands? Is it the warrior-like nature of the people? Is it the fact that it was a Christian kingdom? Did that have anything to do with it? Uh, I, I tend to lean towards the Christian kingdom because I think what is related to that, that people don't think about, is writing. And a lot of times people think about writing, okay, monastic books. But uh, people like uh, James Scott, who's uh, the author of The Art of uh, not being governed and seeing like a state talks about how writing systems allow for a better collection of taxes, which allow for uh, more centralization and the you know establishment of of defense uh, among among other things. But but I don't know. Is it is it any of those things, or is it another factor you point to to why Ethiopia has remained independent in the face of these uh, these oscillations you're talking about? Like we rise and we decline, we rise and decline but we never are fully subjugated long-term by any peoples. Yeah, I think it's it's all all of those I described. It's definitely the patriotic nature that we have, the, the aspect of Christianity, uh, the highlands, but we have to take into context, you know, who are they fighting? Um, because when it comes to the, the Italians, or, you know, if you look deeper into history, because uh, the Italians wasn't the first time that the Ethiopians faced colonization. We faced no. colonization, you know, two times, and that was... The first time was against the Ottoman Turks or, you know, Egyptians, it's, it's combination. Uh, so the Ottoman Turks, you know, tried to conquer. Uh, they were going into northern Asia at that time or Matsoa area and said it's you know, repulsed them in like 1577 or so. Uh, so that was the first time. So that that would I would say like that defeat of the Ottoman Turks is more so Christianity and patriotic nature as you know, Chris, the 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 priests and everything would be on the like the front lines, or like they would be like hitting the kaburo and everything, like saying oh, and then giving all this praise to like the rulers and everything, and saying you know God is going to support us in this war, this war against the Ottoman Turks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas when we look at like Ethiopia, you know, succeeding in the second time we fought the Italians in the nineteen you know thirties, that was more so because of a highland. Uh, aspect uh, because you know in order to do guerrilla warfare successfully uh, islands do really help um, so that aspect uh, led Ethiopia you know to repulsing the Italians but in general it's always a combination of all these three I don't think you can, or I'll, yeah all these three I don't think you can really say you know oh it's one exactly no it's really a combination of all of them yeah, a theory we left out is also the great man theory too you could just say they were just a bunch of great men uh, who are rulers and leaders spawned by all this and add it to all the factors. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, going back to, you know, when we look at the decline of Aksum, and this is really uh, like late Aksum or so after Islam and everything, um, it's just, we don't really know why it completely like fell in the aspect. We are lacking historical sources onto why. This is from the 600s to the 900s. 600s to 900s. Um, we do know Islam paid a fact in the, the control of the Red Sea, which I've talked about. Uh, even then, Ethiopia uh, tried to reassert its control over Southern Arabia. Um, and around like in the 780s or so, they sent a, a, a force to uh, a Jeddah, which is in Saudi Arabia. And... Uh, inflicted great damage, but when they were continuing trying to reassert the control, they were uh, soundly defeated. So we see this like trying to, you know, regain their lost territory or trying to regain what they used to have, but it just kept on declining and declining. And this could be poor leadership. This could be due to lack of economic uh, power. Uh, uh, so just the numerous factors that we can't really, you know, isolate. I, I would like to pinpoint that as my sort of opinion 
is uh, related to kind of the the plague going on now and the ideas of globalism, one of the things that we're having to reflect on is you talked about how, you know, in any monopoly game or strategy game, people sometimes overexpand. And when they overexpand, they have to contract to build themselves up again. So in a sense, you know, you talk about being from Sudan to Somalia to Southern Arabia, modern day Yemen and Saudi Arabia, uh, it looks like the Aksumite kingdom probably overexpanded and was relying on this sort of uh, foreign trade too much. Yeah. And so over the next few centuries, you know, what we are calling decline uh, and what a lot of people call decline is a sort of rebuilding of. So some people refer to this as the kind of dark ages of Ethiopia, but it's also the period in which local institutions are being built more and more. So there's more of a domestic reliance than a internationalist, globalist type alliance. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I second I second what you're saying. Um, I think, yeah, it's just overexerting, like we see it with the Roman Empire and everything, how they overexerted themselves and they just couldn't. It, it capitulated from the inside, but it also is just the fact that they were they had control over too many things. Um, but what we do know what attributed to the decline of Aksum was Queen Yodit. Um, or they also describe her as Sato, but the, the or fire. So, but the origins of Queen Yodit, uh, we pretty much people do assert the fact that she was of Jewish origin. I mean, she was a believer in Judaism. I've heard both. I've heard she's either pagan or Jewish, like yeah, pagan yeah. if she's from one of the southern places, like Sidamo, or yeah. or maybe she was always a Sidamo, but then married one of the the kind of Jewish South Arabians and came back for yeah. vengeance. I've, she's one of those people like Yared that I've heard like three, four different accounts. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's clouded in mystery in the sense, like we know she did completely utterly destroyed like Ethiopia, like in that aspect. But we as to the origins of why she did it, what was her motivations, is really you know, like Hanok said, like three or four different stories. Um. So, uh, the one story is that she was also a member of the royal family, supposedly, and then she re was reduced to being a prostitute and was tricked by a local police, priest, and she ended up being disgraced, but married a Jewish ruler and convert convinced him to destroy Aksum for the, the loss of uh, dignity that she suffered. So this is one possible story as to, you know, the validity. I mean, that's a whole different question. Um, but what we do know is that her rule of Ethiopia like d destroyed numerous churches, uh, killed the numerous people. We have a lot of loss of documentation or sources uh, due to the fact that Yodi destroyed uh, numerous uh, churches and everything. As we know, you know, churches hold a lot of documentation in terms of Ethiopia's history. So there was a lot lost about that. Um, even then, you know, uh, actually, besides I get to that even then point, um, even her background is... It's just completely clouded a mystery in the sense, you know, some people describe her as like a Falasha, Falasha Agu queen, but others say that she was the ruler of Sidama or ruler in Mbale in southern Ethiopia. And now they're saying this, that's more likely, the latter is more likely. But then again, we can't really fully assert with certainty like what it is exactly. Um, but the funny thing is, even after Yodi destroyed Aksum, obliterated it, Aksum didn't like cease to exist yet. It was it still went on for a couple of years, <clears throat> and what happened is that even with the destruction by her, uh, Ambasa uh, Udem restored peace and order in Aksum, and he was the emperor of Aksum. And uh, even after his death, uh, he was success uh, succeeded by Dil Dil uh, Dil uh, Naad. Um, but. And then again, the end of Aksum, we don't know what really happened. Uh, one's myth is or story is that it transitioned into the Zagwe period or Zagwe dynasty and that Dilna's uh, daughter, Masobi, uh, married a man from Agwa of La or Lasta, you know, and uh, his name was uh, Mera Taklahai Marut. So Dilna'ad, who was infuriated by the marriage of his daughter to, this, uh, to the Ago, uh, sent a military force against uh, Meta, but failed, and thus the end of the Aksumai Empire. Uh, then again, like, just like Yodit and Saint Yare, there are numerous stories as to 
uh, how Oxum exactly ended. You know, and, what, re and related to this religious dominance <clears throat> idea, what's fascinating is that you don't see Aksum becoming a Jewish kingdom. You don't see Aksum becoming a pagan kingdom. You see a, continu uh, a continuation from the Aksumite to the Zagwe through the Solomonic period all the way till 1974 and communism strikes of orthodox, the same Orthodox Christianity and the same Giz language being used. Yeah. You don't see, let's replace it with some uh, Cushitic language and all that. So it points to the the mixing of these people that we've said. So these might have been more Cushitic leaning peoples, but they could have also been hyper mixed still. Uh, yeah, it's just it's the research needs to be done more. So much research needs to be done more. We need to figure out what really happened. Uh, and that really leads a segue into how the Zagwe dynasty started, as we don't really know how that started either. Uh, but that's for another time. So, yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. That will be a great survey into the Aksumite period. And hopefully we will be creating a new period of, of flourishing in Ethiopia by getting people interested and, and doing more research and doing more study in in these fields do you have any parting words or thoughts or anything to plug here at the end oh no that was way too long <laughs> it was like an hour and a half plus yeah so if anybody makes it through thank you for watching <laughs>